Uh, we are here to go through the user experience and user interface design uh, for the control room and uh, the control field in general. Uh, how to get all this different information into the knowledge of the operator so he can actually react correctly. Uh, here we have uh, Matteo Galliani, uh, CAT product owner with Beta 80. Uh, Laura Feliz, um, head um, designer at Unblur. And Luca Canizzaro, sales manager at the Way Technology. Uh, we'll start with Matteo Galliani. Okay, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, let's start with a, with a brief agenda of the topic that we are going to go through the, the presentation. First of all, modern user interface and UX design in theory. So a couple of uh, pillars upon which, in our opinion, is useful, to, is useful and is necessary to build the next generation of the computer-aided dispatch tools of the trade, so some tools that are in use while practicing the, 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 the discipline that is explained at the first point, then mixing process and knowledge and UX, and we are going to discover what's the meaning behind this, this point during the presentation, and then some practical example how to put in place the knowledge and the information that we are going to see. Let's start with a, with a brief joke, <laughs> let's say. Looking at the user interface, we all know how the, the user inter interface is made. Uh, we all use a smartphone, uh, tablets, and a website. This is the layout of a typical Apple product. Very simple. One button, one action, easy, linear, fi fine. And this is, for example, the typical Google product. I can search and can see the list of, of results. Plain. I know what to find, where, where I had to find. And then we have our companies up and our computer-aided dispatch, something that we have to deal with it every single day. So we started from this, uh, from, from this joke to analyze how can we provide the best user interface and user, um, and user experience starting from what we expect, what our customer expect, that this, your company is up. And we were able to identify those points that, in our opinion, are the ones that better uh, express what are the needs while creating, while working on a user interface for a computer-aided dispatch. Let's start for the, with the first point, co-impressive. The application must display all the data that are needed. Of course, we cannot decide to remove some fields, reorganize the screens, uh, by removing data. We know that all the information that are a huge amount that are available in a computer-aided dispatch are all necessary, and we cannot decide to remove that information to create a better UX and UI. We have other tools in order to improve that, but for sure, a user interface of a computer-aided dispatch must be complete, must contain all the information and gives the ability to fill all the information that are needed for the call taker and the dispatcher to perform his action. Second item is flexible, adapting to the process. The idea is that a CAD user interface must not force who is using it, the agency, the one wants to service, the ambulance services, and so on, to follow the process that is stated by the software or by the user interface. In our opinion, what is the best is that the software follow the procedure, help the operator while working, while presenting the content, while navigating among the screen, uh, it must help the action of the call taker or dispatcher. It must not force him to use the software in a way that is not comfortable for their process. That's why the flexibility, so the capability of adapting a software, a user interface, and the user experience based on what are the needs of the customer. Responsive. I already mentioned tablet, smartphone, uh, and, and so on. We can also mention uh, workstation with several screen. Uh, uh, different uh, perspective, um, a, a user interface of the next generation <laughs> has to be responsive. Focus, the focus is another interesting topic. Logic display of data. The idea is that maybe we don't need all that data, or, but we don't need all the data together at the same moment. 
So the idea is try to reorganize, try to analyze and find a way to organize the same content, so the same powerful information that we have and we need to manage, but provide it in a way that helps the user that is using it. Provide what is needed in the time that you need. So comprehensive, but also focused and accessible. Of course, we, we know that we are not creating a video game or, or a website for a bakery. We are creating a software that is used by people on long shift, that they are performing a critical, um, critical action, critical processes, and the software must not be a constraint for, him, for them. That's why we found out really useful this methodology that is design thinking. Design thinking is in use not just for designing a computer aided dispatch, it's used for design in general, product design. So a new amazing toothbrush or uh, a new bag, but also and especially, let me say, software. And of course, computer aided dispatch that has a higher level of complexity. And this uh, methodology provides an in iterative process. So a certain amount of phases that can be repeated, reworked, improved, and are all connected. So the outcome of the first one is the input for the, for the next one. And we are going to see what does it mean every single phase. What is important to, to understand is the uh, different perspective in that this methodology suggests in order to approach a new functionality a new feature or a problem that has to be solved. And the difference is that this methodology suggests to use a human-centric approach. So try to put in the shoes of the people that is going to use the software as developers, as stakeholders, so as the user that is using, as the managers, all the whole team that is going to create this new functionality. So it's really important that now we are focusing on the people that is using and what they want to achieve, not the coolest technology or the best uh, graphics uh, or logos. Let's, let's start for the, with the first uh, phase, that is emphasize. Emphasize is exactly what I just mentioned. It's the, fir the first and the most important uh, of the phase, and is to be in touch who is going to use the software, work with them, try to impersonate him, try to visit the environment in which the software or that functionality is going to be used. So it's a totally different approach from a requirement of a tender that state, uh, I want this functionality. It's totally different. It's, it state, let's discuss what you want to achieve and let's create uh, together, let's analyze the, the problem together to figure out what you really want to achieve. We are not even talking about the solution, I can do it, I cannot do it. It's expensive, it's not expensive. It's a matter of uh, determining which one is the action. The second one is, the, is define. So once we have analyzed the environment, uh, the user, what they expect, is try to express a problem with a simple statement. And again, the statement won't be, I want a red button on top of the screen. But the statement should be something like, as a user, I want to be able to do something and then let's figure out how to deal with it, how to implement it. It's a different approach, it's a totally different approach. Third phase, ideate, brainstorming, pure brainstorming. The most amazing ideas comes from the most unexpected people. So let's discuss brainstorming. After brainstorming, one, another important uh, phase is the prototype. So let's put it on paper, for example, wireframe, let's share it with most people to understand what the real feeling, an idea that seems amazing, while you try to play with it, it, it becomes uncomfortable, for example, not perfect, and again, you can switch again to define. We can you can switch to gathering information again. Testing. Testing is, let's create uh, a simple version of this functionality, and again, give it to the operator, let play with him, beta version, that it doesn't mean that crash. It means uh, le let's, do, let's test it and let me know if it fits. And then the implementation. Just to give you uh, an idea on what's going on, lots of post-it, lots of markers, uh, analyzing the flow, filtering the priorities, uh, mock-up, uh, wireframes for example, and the whole team 
this team is not made of developers. There are business unit managers, the delivery managers, uh, developers, designers, that they are working together with the customer as well. This was the most uh, the theory be behind that. Of course, it's a methodology can be used, but then has to be applied to the technology because in the end we are creating software. And one a nice example that, that we found in order to put in place what we have discussed in the first slide, so regarding comprehensive, flexible, responsive, focused, and accessible, is for example the Microsoft Fluent UI guidelines. It's not the only one, but it's a nice example. Let's take uh, this example, navigation panel. When I have to switch context, I have to know where to find that switch context. I cannot switch from uh, an incident to the list of incident uh, to the map uh, every time from a different place. It becomes complex to recognize. For example, the navigation pa panel that allow me to change the context on, uh, on the left bar that appear just when needed. We have more space and we have a single point in which we know that we, if we have to change the, the point of view, we can do that. And this is an example of, uh, of an implementation of a computer-aided dispatch that, that use that navigation bar on the left side that appear and disappear. Uh, the, the command, the action, the buttons are always on top right of the section that is involved. So, create an incident, save an incident on top right of the incident, but refresh the location information system or center the map to the coordinates is close to the coordinates. Um, search bar. Avoid to manually, manually select a single item, but give the possibility to search and autocomplete. Using of um, Tab, tab subdivision to field again to filter uh, the, the, the section and gives an indication in the section that are not visible that there are data behind. So you can easily recognize and pay attention to the fact there is something behind. Or using text of icon or icons. Everybody is able to understand what's the meaning of the save button, for, for example, so the, the floppy disk button. But other items like uh, close an incident or accept uh, an incident, it's not always easy to be represented. The, the other part is what we mentioned regarding focusing, that is the fact that based on the process that is managing the software, the same software in this case, ma must follow the, um, the needs by providing the information that are needed in, in the moment while are needed. This is a layout of 112 service, for example. So we have the location information, we have the qualification of the incident, but the same user interface may not be provided to a second level piece up that manage firefighters, for example. Because in this example, the firefighters choose to have the question and answer script because they are already receiving an incident from 112 with the localization, they prefer to have something in order to detail the classification and to have it automatically available. The location information may be retrieved in a sub-panel, in a tab menu, for example. Another, uh, another example, uh, course guard. We are using managing uh, streets uh, and, and so on. In the sea, we don't have streets. So they usually fill in coordinates in different formats. So the same address panel that we have seen before now has a different perspective. And it's more focused on the coordinate instead of typing an address. And maybe type and subtype uh, is not enough. The possibility to specify, based on the incident type, some additional fields. Yeah. So, <coughs> Uh, maybe we have time for one question because we started a couple of minutes late. Anyone with a question? Or you want to catch him during the coffee break, which is immediately following this session? So thank you. Thank you. And uh, yes, and now we're on to Laura Feliz. Um, if I managed. Have a good one.
Yeah, I don't know how to take off the mask from this. Yeah, I decided to use this opportunity to take my mask off. I hate this thing. <laughs> I just might leave it and you just ignore it as well. Yeah. Okay. Anyone have scissors? <laughs> no, I leave it for later. <laughs> just I will need it, no? So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So I'll try to be very quick, but since I'm in Spanish, so I'm always on a rush. So I guess it won't be a problem. So design. Sorry, all the slides will be in black. Can we lower the lights a bit more, maybe? Otherwise, you guys don't want to see anything. No. OK, so what we understand for good design. We can all agree that things like, so is everything happening to me? I don't know where to click it. Where should I point it? Sorry, guys. Like, I swear I, I come very prepared. OK. I sleep really slowly, that's why. Where should I point it, sorry? Again? Just like. Don't know. Okay. Yeah? Great. It's not working. I can just explain you like row. Well, there was some really nice uh, design slides explaining that we all can agree that what we mean as a good design. In there? Got it. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the question comes when we have to ask what it means for bad design. This is not working really, <laughs> sorry. I can make you a sign and then you pass it. Okay. So next one. Thank you. <laughs> That's our. That's the quickest presentation, right? <laughs> no. Don't know it away because they, you guys are like time track. So should I follow without presentation? Okay, the third slide actually. So the other slide was asking you guys what it was about bad design and what we understand for it without entering into personal taste, uh, preferences or fashion uh, related. There you go, Hadid, next. Thank you. <laughs> Rams, Santa Cole, next one please. There is more, so we all agree one is well executed. Next one. Next one. And next one. <laughs> okay, now it's gonna be one by slide. So <laughs> no no, keep keep going. Next one. <laughs> no no wait, wait. two two. Next one. And next one, my favorite one. That's the best one, eh? We've all been there, right? So what all these images that we've seen in a slowly path has in common is that, as Matteo say, no one put in place of the user. No one took the time to think or imagine how the user will feel um, using those things. Next one. They are non-user friendly, really clear, right? Next one. So what happens when we mix bad design and emerging services software? Next one. Drama. <laughs> Saying it really raw, a uh, well-designed interface is not only saving, or not only can save your life, but also the ones using it, right? So next one. Sorry, you're going to hear the next one word. Hi, my name is Laura Feliz. I'm the design director of Umblur, and we're going to talk about design for emerging services. So I spent most of my career, next one, on fashion retail, 
a next one. This is my fault because I was making effects of, you know, like fade and so on. So, and now this is all the fashion that I see. Next one. Um, so the question is, uh, my day to day is develop usable, accessible, and practical software, mainly for incident commanders that are on the field, also for their crews. So in this context that we move, there is still a lot of analogical ways of working, like whiteboards or pen and papers, etc. So the question is like how us as designers, we should create these solutions, um, thinking of the, like the usage of technology that make easier their lives and their day to day, right? So it's really simple. We keep these things usable, accessible, and user center always as a mantra. Uh, nowadays, we have a lot of technologies, a lot of, a lot of software. We have artificial intelligence. We have thermal cameras, etc. But that all together sometimes only brings more saturation to the incident commander it, itself, uh, himself or herself. So um, how to make this seamless uh, transformation into the digital world without uh, making them feel that they are left behind. Because sometimes what we observe is that there is software companies that come, give the training, and you never hear from them again. What happens is that if it's not useful, they might stop using it, right? So if we listening, that's the magic word. What we do as designers, again, and, and the amazing team I work with is we spend, you sure? I'm really scared of this, yeah? Okay. So listening, we spend a huge amount of time with them on their spaces of work, on their fields, listening to their stories, what they have to say, their feedback, because no one of us, we are part-time designers, I designer, sorry. Uh, police or firefighters or uh, any emergency services related. So it will be very easy to ask them, how can, what do you need for an app? No? Or uh, what is your problem? Here's your solution. What we do is co-creation is same as Mateo show. We mix groups of work and we present their solu our solutions to them and it's always on top of our priority because uh, without their approval or their feedback, uh, we've done nothing. This works. I'm not going to get too much into the design thinking process. I will focus specifically on the last part, that is the testing. How to test something when the, their environment or what it's going to be launched or work is the real life. You cannot test something that is like half done or almost good, right? So what we use is their exercises, their trainings, uh, every possibility that we can uh, blend the reality or like the, most, the closest reality so we can test our apps or our solutions into that. Um, we are, sometimes we fail, like my presentation at the beginning, for example. Uh, one example that I can share with you is that at the beginning uh, of the company, when we didn't have too much, uh, too many users, uh, we were testing our first application with the people we had around. When we went to the real end users, and we saw that they were like a German pilots of two meters tall, we realized that they were clicking five buttons in once. So lesson learned. Uh, sometimes we also celebrate, and one of the things that uh, is still getting ghost bumps for me is when. The first time that I show a firefighter for Midwest Wales, uh, something like that came from a conversation six months ago, uh, a feedback, and it was turned into a functionality. So on that moment, like you remember this conversation we had, this feedback you gave me, look, this is what we come through. So it's not only listening to their feedback and making something useful for them, with them, but also for us to be part of that, right? Um, This is our main competitor. It's like in, in this world where is all technologies available, artificial intelligence that we are working with, machine learning, uh, we made like 3D buildings and we are able to, you know, everything. If this is easier, this is easier than using our technology or our solution, that means our work is not done. So we have to keep that on mind. 
I, I would like to finish, I rush a lot, uh, with a, my favorite phrase that is, if you think good design is expensive, you should look at the cost of bad design. Thank you. That's the fastest I could do. And now I have time enough. <laughs> so I hope you really have oh, a thank, thank you. That was well done. I left a lot of examples. Both the handling of the crisis at the beginning and the speed of which you completed. So we have time for questions. Um, any questions from the audience? Clear. Any from you guys here? No. So I think we're done. Laura, Great. thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>I'm Luca Canizzaro, I'm Sales and Business Development Manager for Waitic Italy, and uh, today we, we're going to talk about how to build up a control room in a mission-critical environment, and what take in consideration to have this control room more effective. So we will see what are the challenges on building this, uh, this control room. And then we will speak about uh, some tailor-made user interface, real-time performances, uh, trustful and future-proof solution, and how to minimize some security risks. And for sure, we, are, we will also uh, take a look on the cost side. So basically, <clears throat> what are the main challenges in, uh, in a complex control room? So basically, I think that the main challenge is that uh, our friend Peter can manage all the information coming from different systems in a good way and uh, without too much pressure and uh, make that he feel comfortable and it can be uh, effective during his, uh, his working hours. So in a complex control room, we usually have a lot of subsystems that uh, most of the time they don't talk to each other. So we can have the CAD system with the maps uh, and the GIS and all the alerting systems. But uh, maybe we can have also the access control of the building. We can have some video surveillance stuff, uh, and we can also have some communication devices or, uh, or systems. And for sure, also the office system, so where we write the emails. All these things have to be managed by our friend Peter. So the challenge is to uh, let him work very, very efficiently. So at the beginning, when you plan to build a, a new control room, you you think about a cozy control room where they feel very comfortable with uh, a, nice, a nice working environment. And this is good. And you probably have this result for the first one or two years. But then other systems come into, into the room. And uh, if you don't plan it correctly, it can be that after a while you have this situation. And I, know, I don't know how many of you worked in a control room, but I think that if there are some, you already faced this uh, kind of situation. That is normal, actually. And, um, but this can, can bring some, uh, some risk at the end, risks at the end. And uh, so we can analyze from our experience that we had in this, uh, in this market for a while, what can be the risks. So one of it can be the jeopardize work satisfaction of the operator. So this can then be uh, translated in a staff fluctuation or the, the staff doesn't feel very comfortable to come to work and maybe they have some issues. And we have a yeah, solution, maybe not solution, but way of thinking. So we have to think about, as also Matteo and Laura said already, so we have to be flexible uh, and have some individual setups that fits for any single user. So here again, we have to talk to the users. We have to have a, a, a control room or a system that is, is easy to use. And we don't have to forget about real-time performances, because we, we will see this later in, uh, in another slide. Um, yeah, we will talk this uh, later. Um, the situation that we saw before with all this mess on the, on the desk 
can also uh, brings to can also increase some risk, some operational risk, because you can imagine you have a, such a mess, a lot of mice and a lot of keyboards. Maybe you mistype something, and uh, the risk there is uh, to have. Uh, yeah, for sure, the operator is responsible of that, then you can have some uh, lack of trust from them or a loss of reputation or, as, as before, you don't feel very well. And in the worst case, sure, this can be also uh, translated into uh, some loss of life, assets or infrastructure, depending on what your control room is controlling, actually. Again, here, <clears throat> We, we need or you need to prefer a, a tailor-made solution where you have instant access to all the information and all the sources. Again, must be ready to use. And think about something where you can share the, the situation with the other stakeholder in the room in order that the, the operator can have some advice during the operation and maybe it feel better to have some other opinion if he's in an in a emergency situation. Uh, other risks you can have, but this risk you can have it everywhere, also at home or in a normal office, uh, are system outages. So, also here, a suggestion is uh, to, keep, uh, to keep the things separated, the system or the subsystem separated, so different sources, different displays, and prefer, uh, try to, to have a, a, a user and role management uh, solution. For sure, the redundancy uh, is something that is mandatory, actually. <laughs> So basically, what do you need to achieve such a result or this, this point uh, is a situation, is, a, is something that we saw in the agenda. So one point is, for example, having a tailor-made user interface, as they said also, speaking with the guys. Think about ergonomics. It's something that is not uh, always uh, taught. It's something that is really important for the user because the shifts are eight hours, 10 hours, so you have to think about ergonomics, by ergonomics I mean how the display are placed, uh, how the desks are, if you can live up, stand up, if uh, also the chairs, these kind of things. Then you have to have a, um, an easy and intuitive access to all the design and information, so the user, yeah, it, everything has to be intuitive. And again, uh, here, um, you have to have a solution that supports the operators who bear the responsibility for making the right decision, so guide them through the process. Uh, you have, the, the solution has to be fast. You can switch from one thing to the other really, really fast. And as I said before, we have to uh, think about collaborating, so share this information also to other users. These are the main points. Then. Uh, uh, again, here, the, the multiple individualized user or event-driven layout, it means that uh, you, every user should have his own layout because not, the user, or not all the users are the same. So maybe you want, uh, as a user, I prefer to have a big window for certain things and the other user not, so make it flexible. Um, and your solution, your control room, actually, at the end, um, it must be easy to integrate a third-party system uh, in the future. Um, some, when, when we build a new control room, some prefer to put, to have a remote solution, to, to have the remote, uh, to have the computer apart or uh, even virtualized. If you think about this, so not having the computer under the desk, keep an eye on the real, perf on the real time performance. This is very important. I saw that uh, the user gets stressed when the, ma the mouse doesn't respond quickly or uh, the keyboard doesn't respond quickly, then it's a cause of stress. And stress is the worst enemy we can have in such a situation. Um, I'm going a bit long, so I should speed up. Oh, no, we have time. Huh? <laughs> um, when you build up a control room to avoid the situation that we saw, think about the future in the beginning, at the beginning of the process. So uh, you have to have a, a control room that is able to integrate different applications. So the application that you used in the past, the application that you are using now, but also the ones that will come in the future. And uh, it can integrate also the IT environment. This is important for the maintenance of the control room and control uh, center. 
Um, try to um, go for a standard based solution that is not intrusive in your PC, in your systems. And uh, find a partner or uh, a partner that is, can guarantee can, that you can follow from the development to the end and, uh, and then support your control room because it will be very important. Um, and choose a solution that will be supported for a long time because your control room must stay at least, I would say, for 10 years at least. So, and as, as, as before, think about the future in case, for example, if you, if you are planning to uh, build a video wall, think about what we have now, what is the new technology. Maybe you don't implement it now, but be prepared to be implemented in the future. Um, then we saw in the agenda also the security threat. For sure, we will have some security threat. Uh, and in a mission critical control room, we have to avoid this. So for our experience, we divided this in three main pillars. Um, the first one is uh, we recommend, uh, or at least we saw that it's better to housing your systems on sources in a computer room, so this will protect your IT asset, your PC will stand more, and uh, you uh, avoid some un unauthorized accesses. And uh, doing this, you can also restrict and control the physical access to USB ports. This is very important where we talk, when we talk about cybersecurity, so the USB ports can be a threat. And uh, by centralizing everything, then you will be more efficient and cost effective in the maintenance, during the maintenance procedure. The second pillar is the authentication. So try to access your system always via an authentication device. If you have standalone computer under your desk or if you are using a KVM system, doesn't matter, but uh, think about this. And uh, uh, try to implement an access right management also. So users that have higher priority than others, like the chief of the operation has higher priority on some system than the normal operator or these kind of things. So in order to restrict some access level. And the third one from my side is one, yeah, is one of the most important is um, we have seen the picture. You, you will uh, you will get in the in the time different system, and usually these systems are in different network. They don't speak, so try to keep this separated. I know it's very fancy to have everything in one computer, but it can be also very dangerous. So just evaluate this, the pro and the con, and then uh, make your your evaluation. Uh, so try to keep it independent, and this, as as uh, written here, it will prevent the infection of a higher security level, higher security environment from a low security environment. And I had this on, on the field and uh, it's true. Uh, you have to think about this. And um, if you can use a KVN system, this will be much better because then uh, you will keep the system separated, but for the operator will be only one console. So the stress of the operator will be less. This is the, the main challenge and uh, you, we, you can achieve it by doing, by doing this. Uh, the last was about prices. Yeah, sure. Uh, when you build up a control room, it will have a cost. But uh, don't think only at the cost, the, the, the operative cost to build up this control room. Sure, you can try to to lower a bit the investment, but uh, if you do it everything properly, then you will see the, um, the savings later by reducing, for example, the IT maintenance cost, by optimizing the, the, the shift of the operator, for example. You don't need maybe three operators during the night shift. Two are enough because you can control all the system from two consoles. And um, if you have a nice, uh, a nice environment and less, st less uh, stress on the operator, you will reduce the employee absences for sure. So uh, it's also a saving here. And then, again, if you do everything properly, you can also save on, uh, on real estate because then you will, uh, you will occupy less space for your control room and for your uh, system room. This is what uh, we saw in our career, so I hope can help. If you have any question, just 
I think you can do it now, otherwise you can come and visit us uh, on the booth number 14. Well, thank you, Luca. Uh, any questions from the audience? Here and now, otherwise you can look him up. You almost raised your hand, but you were just scratching. <laughs> so that was close. But uh, <clears throat> then I'd just like to remind you that um, there is a coffee break. You're a bit early, so you can catch the coffee while it's still hot, hopefully. Uh, but be here or in one of the track rooms at 1635, um, where there is a session on advanced mobile location in track one. It doesn't say here on my piece of paper what's in track two or three. And then there is a networking cocktail at 1735 in the exhibition area. So um, that's together you know, loose voices to talk together. So have a great coffee break. Thank you.